believe uh, fundamentally my, my role and responsibility is to help represent Utah to Washington, not Washington to Utah. But I do appreciate this opportunity to share a perspective and answer your questions and, and uh, give a little bit of a reported perspective on what's happening and, and just as importantly what's not happening uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, my number one concern continues to be the lack of fiscal discipline and attention to the financial details of this country. Uh, last I reported, we were growing this national debt at a record level that continues. Uh, but now the debt is over $16 trillion. Last I was here, I reported that we were spending more than $600 million a day in interest on our national debt. That number is now more than $700 million a day. It's just the daily interest rate or interest payment that we make on our national debt. As you know, the, uh, the federal government runs on a, on a uh, fiscal year. That fiscal year started October 1st. The first quarter, spending was up 16%. 16%. We have over a $300 billion deficit in just the first three months. And this continues. Now, we've had some tax increases. The projection now from the Congressional Budget Office as of a couple days ago is that our deficit for the year will be just less than a trillion dollars if everything continues the way that it's supposed to go. But I'm still deeply concerned that while the president was able to propel and get through his tax increases, the so-called balance that he asked for has not yet been fully implemented. And that is we also need spending cuts. If we're truly going to have balance, we're going to have to have some spending cuts. Now, one of the things that's looming here is the sequestration. On the one hand, I feel good about it because we do have to cut spending. On the other hand, I'm worried about what it's going to mean for the Department of Defense. Everything that we're going to cut has, can't be on the backs of the Department of Defense, and I'm one that supports defense cuts. There is waste, fraud, abuse at the Department of Defense, but we have to engage in entitlement reform. The reason we have a 16% increase in spending is because entitlements. And we have to understand how, where we are with entitlements. Let me give you just a few statistics. One of the concerns is the number of our citizens who are claiming disability. Back in 1987, about 2% of our population was on disability. Today, that number is in excess of 4.6%. Now, I feel for the people that can't take care of themselves, of course we're supposed to have a safety net to help take care of them. In fact, I went up uh, earlier this year to go visit the Utah School for the Deaf and Blind, and I, could, I was so impressed at what they do and how they do it. That is just a remarkable facility. Of course we're supposed to do that. But when you have doubled, as a percentage, the number of people who are claiming disabilities, and so many of those are in the mental health capacity, so many of those are in the then you have to come back and take a look at that. Also deeply concerned that over the last 10 years alone, 10 years, there are 30 million more Americans on food stamps. 30 million. And again, of course we're supposed to have a safety net, but we have to get this under control and we're going to have to deal with it. Because the entitlement growth is, is eating us alive. We have roughly 10,000 people a day who are now retired. And this bubble will continue to move its way through the system. My point being is, this is the most, as Paul Ryan likes to say, the most predictable financial crisis we've ever had in the history of our nation. But it's going to require entitlement reform. There's no other way around it. In very, very rough terms, okay, in very rough terms, you got two buckets. You have your entitlements, a spending which is accounts for roughly two-thirds of the budget. The other third of the budget only sits over here in discretionary. And so while we're concerned about the sequestration, we have passed twice out of the House of Representatives a way to transfer that and make some adjustments other than just cutting so deeply into the Department of Defense. But that sequestration, sequestration is moving forward. I think one of the great threats that's out there is the Air Force Base. And for those our friends and colleagues and neighbors and loved ones in the top of Utah, this is a very real threat. I know Rob Bishop and Chris Stewart and others were working on this. We've already passed two bills that would help avert this, but we're going to have to see how that plays out. There's nothing like a deadline in Washington, D.C. to actually develop forward. I do want to credit 
the state and this body in particular for its work on making sure that we were responsibly dealing with our state pensions. Thank goodness the state of Utah made the transition and dealt with defined contribution versus defined benefit plans. Now the very first bill I introduced in the last Congress and I'm getting ready to introduce again is a resolution that says don't, states, don't look to the federal government to bail you out. But unfortunately some other states, Illinois for instance, has a $98 billion unfunded liability. They have not made these tough decisions. They have not made this transition. California has over $100 billion in unfunded liabilities. My concern is that they're going to suddenly come looking to, to the federal government to bail them out instead of doing the right appropriate thing like we did here in the state of Utah. I think it's one of the great threats to our nation. And I think you're going to see a whole series of bankruptcies uh, roll across this nation. But we cannot lean solely on the federal government to, to bail these people out. Now, one of the great opportunities that we have out there, because not everything is grown, is in the world of cyber. Uh, I, I'm on a couple of committees that overlook cyber, and I can tell you that the high-tech industry as a whole is a real boom for the state of Utah. We have great companies here expanding and growing, companies like Oracle and Adobe and some of our homegrown companies and Vivid and others that are growing and expanding and creating real jobs and great income for Utah families. At the same time, I can tell you in some of the classified uh, hearings and, and meetings that I have been in, in my four short years, I have seen an escalation of concern from those that watch this, this, this cyber traffic on a daily basis that this country continues to be under attack. I cannot stress enough how serious this situation is. If somebody was going into our banks as an armed robber and trying to steal money, we would send every resource we could to take care of it. But when it happens in the dead of night, it happens over these cyber waves, then you just don't have the visibility to it. Having seen a lot of classified information that unfortunately I can't talk about, I cannot stress enough how much attention the public needs to pay to attention to this, our financial institutions need to pay to this, the power grid. These are things that our senior people at the Department of Defense, at the NSA, and others continue to tell us is a very real and immediate threat. And I would continue to make sure that, uh, that you stress that when it comes across your table, please pay attention to it because it is in a very serious state. But if again, for our economy, Utah's at the forefront. I think we'll continue to attract uh, California-based companies and others, and they're going to find that Utah's the best place to do business. I also believe that one of the great opportunities we have here deals with our land. I like the vision that was put forward by the governor, and, and, and I like the idea that we don't have to buy into this false choice that if we want to have energy development, we're giving up on protecting our lands. And inversely, we can protect our lands at the same time we are able to do some energy development. I'm working closely with Rob Bishop and Chris Stewart, who's new and just joining in this effort. I think you'll see uh, us introduce a package. We're working very closely with the county commissioners who are critical to this process on a county by county basis. But we have to make some energy uh, we have to make some decisions relating to our lands so we can grow and expand the recreational opportunities and, and, and uh, economy that's so important to our state. We can continue to enjoy those lands, but at the same time, tap into the energy resources that really is going to fuel our future, provide opportunities and revenue to the state to create the win-win that this nation needs. And again, I, I am eternally optimistic. I, I, I just am. But I have to tell you that Washington, D.C. has spent many times more. It's a mess. It is an absolute mess. But we want to be part of the solution. We don't want to be just part of the problem. We're going to have to come together on entitlement reform. We're going to have to come together on some of the financial pieces. If we don't get the financial equation right, we'll never, ever solve the other challenges that are out there ahead of us. I'm on three committees. I'm on Judiciary, uh, which I've been on in the past. I do think we'll see some movement on, it, on immigration. Um, I think we, we, I'm also uh, on Homeland Security, which is new for me. I am on the Cyber uh, Subcommittee. I'm also on the Counterterrorism Subcommittee with Peter King. Uh, and then my favorite committee, which is the Oversight Committee. The Oversight Committee, we have jurisdiction over literally everything. 
Um, but I am the chairman of the subcommittee on national security, homeland defense, and foreign operations. And, uh, so I want to just end my comments before we take questions by saying I cannot uh, be more proud of our Utah National Guard. Uh, and the men and women who serve with the other in the armed services, uh, I have traveled across this world and across this globe. There's not a place that you go to every once in a while you have somebody pop up and say, hey, I'm from, I'm from Warren, or I'm, I'm from Layton, or I'm from... I met some Marines out in the toughest parts of Afghanistan, and these three kids came up, one of these Marines was from Springville, and he could have made us more proud. I cannot thank the Utah National Guard for what they do and how they do it, and I hope our communities continue to take care of those families who are serving and giving everything away for their families. I still think we do a better job there as a community, but they make us proud and, and uh, do amazing work around the world. So, Mr. President, I appreciate having you here. here and happy to answer any questions you have. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Questions for Congressman Senator Healy. Thank you. Uh, welcome all. Thank you. Um, let me just ask you two questions that I hear a lot. As you know, we're in the process of trying to put a budget together. Our Constitution requires us to be out of here on the 14th of March. And, and the logistics of preparing a budget means we have to be well done before the 1st of March. Uh, Congress apparently has taken seat frustration and said, I think March 1st is the deadline. I'm trying to find out what really would be impacted if the sequestration goes into effect. As I understand it, a lot of it needs to be in the bill itself for those agencies to be spread out. I think it would be helpful for, for us, and me especially, but for the body, to have some idea of what exactly areas would be pinpointed. I, I talked to Veterans Affairs the other day and said, well, we're, we're exempt from it, so they're not impacted. The second question I have is I have people come to me and say, you know, you're, you're idiots for not taking all this federal money. Because eventually we're going to have to pay it back. And so we give it all to all the other states. We don't take any, but we're going to be responsible for paying part of this back. How would you respond to that second question? Those, those are two areas I want to talk about. Um, the budget process is probably one of the most frustrating. Um, in, in the United States Congress, I'm so uh, frustrated with the United States Senate. It's been four years since the Senate has passed the budget. Now, the way it's supposed to work, as you know, is the House passes a budget, the Senate passes a budget, and inevitably they're different, but then you can go to reconciliation, and you can get past the, the, uh, some of the other rules that are there, because in reconciliation, you, can, you only have to get to a 50 plus one. You don't have to get uh, past the closure and the 60 vote threshold. But when the Senate never even passes a budget, you can see where there's a problem. Now, the president is also required by law to submit a budget. And for the third time, uh, the president's budget is late. We don't have it. It's still, it's still not there. It's required by law to be in by a certain date, and he missed that date. I don't understand that, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with. I will tell you, though, in four years in a row, uh, the president submitted his budget. Not a single person in the House or Senate Republican or Democrat has ever voted in favor of the president's budget. So the budget process is broken down, and the entire time we've been there, we've operated on these continuing resolutions, which is the worst possible way to do things. Now, in the House, we have passed the budget in the last two years, and we've tried to operate in that. But we have not only sequestration, but we have the continuing resolution that also expires. The debt ceiling discussion got punted back until May, but these three things are really going to be the drivers. And so I feel for the state who's trying to make some big decisions, we don't know what the federal government's going to do. Now, sequestration, I'll have to get you a list of, of those, and, and we'll make sure that every senator gets those. Again, the House has passed two different versions to have adaptations of that sequestration. But the president was adamant in this. He pushed for it. They got it through. Um, and we're going to have some spending cuts. It's just a matter of where those are going to be. But that is, that is the frustration that is Washington, D.C. that files into you because you have no idea what it's going to be. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, but the process is broken down. I hope that the Senate this year will pass a budget. Um, that is supposed to be passed and in place by April 15th. And then from there, you can go into the reconciliation process. And everybody talks about, well, we need to compromise. We need to, you can't 
the, the process is such as you get to the compromise when you get to reconciliation. That's where you work out these differences and then have to go on it. Um, I know that's not terribly helpful, but that's the reality of what's, what's going on and, and why it's so frustrating because we never actually do these, these things in the in, in regular order as the speaker likes to, likes to call them. I'm sorry, the second part of your question was, how do you answer the, the, the oh, about taking the money because yeah. others are taking it and we're going to have to all pay that? Uh, it, when I went into Congress, I was adamant that we wanted to repeal No Child Left Behind. I, I wanted to repeal No Child Left Behind. I don't even think there should be a federal department of education as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I remember at one point we had a, a uh, Supreme Court justice come to meet with us um, privately, and uh, a group of us were meeting with them, and I asked them, I said, how do we invoke the 10th Amendment? How do we stand up for states' rights and our ability to sit? stop taking their money? Don't take their money, and, uh, and, and guys like me are not going to vote that you have to do it. And, but easier said than done, right? Because in terms of all these different programs, there's so much uh, flowing money from Utah, Part of my answer, part of my response, what I wish we could do is, is you're exactly right. If we don't take the money, we're still going to have to pay for it. And, and that's, that's the rub. Now, I'm very supportive of what uh, Congressman Langford out of Oklahoma, Congressman uh, Garrett out of New Jersey are doing, for instance, on the gas tax. This is probably the most crystal clear example for me. I would like the states to have the ability to exempt themselves out of having to collect and remit the, the gas tax, the federal gas tax. It seems ridiculous to me that you go to the pump, you pay this money, it goes to the federal government, uh, and then you've got to fight and hope that you get a percentage of it back. I'd much rather leave it to this body to figure out the needs and the rates and how we're going to collect that and not have to deal with all the federal regulations that come with having to when you use federal dollars on a project. So I think the short answer to that is, if you take the money, you're going to probably have to pay by the federal rules. But if you don't take the money, you're probably still going to have to pay for it. And again, this is why I worry about the bailouts for these other states. That's why I voted against the bigger, broader Sandy Relief Package, $60 billion. Um, it's just, I, you know, I, I just, there's got to be an end to it, and there's got to be a way to pay for it. Um, and if states exempt themselves out, then they should get some relief for the individual taxpayers that not have to pay into it. But the, remember, uh, the federal government is spending about $10 billion a day. $10 billion a day. And it's just not sustainable. Any other questions? Mr. Jones? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, welcome to my new representative. Salt Lake County, some of us uh, in your district, and I appreciate you being here today. Um, I wanted to just mention that fiscal irresponsibility is not limited to one political party. I think we've seen it over the last several years. Uh, but I did want to just say that um, I think the challenge is how do we get people to know that it's a shared sacrifice? It seems like those that squawk the most about uh, getting federal money and the, the, the deficit and so forth are the very people that are expecting new roads, um, you know, tuition, federal programs, uh, Pell grants, uh, those kinds of things. And I just had my higher education appropriations committee, and uh, UVU, who's one of our great institutions in our state, was lamenting that um, they need more money because some of the federal programs for tuition are probably going away. That's one case in point, and of course that's a big problem with all of our institutions. So how do we get people to understand that if in fact we do have a blue need, and we do, and I completely agree with that, federal budget, that it's our, a shared responsibility with all of us, it's a shared sacrifice, but all of us will have to understand that. Could you comment on that, please? Yes, and, and, uh, and thank you. I, I do agree that uh, we got into this mess, not just because the Democratic Party, but both parties. I mean, the reason I ran for office is I felt like the Republicans who had the House and Senate and the presidency, they blew it. In part because they overspent, they lowered taxes, and then they raised spending. You can't have it both ways. And so you have to cut and pare back spending and make difficult choices. So when a choice then becomes, do we fund higher education? Do we do some of the other things that we would like to do? 
Or do we send foreign aid out by the billions of dollars to, we send $60 million to China for foreign aid. Don't see why we do that. Um, it, you can go on down the list, and what, what the federal government is not doing, and I, it's on both sides of the aisle, believe me, is we're not making difficult choices. If we had the disaster that was the Sandy, then maybe we gotta stop not spending, we gotta make a tough decision and not spend money somewhere else and provide the relief that is needed. But if we don't pay for these things, which has been the routine, then you can see where it continues to be a problem. A trillion dollar deficit year after year after year is just not sustainable. And the consequence, what I, I guess I want all of the public, because you talk about shared sacrifice, there's going to be shared pain. Because the consequence of this massive debt is going to be hyperinflation, rapid inflation, and it's going to be coupled with rising interest rates. Because the Chinese and the Japanese and the others that buy our national debt are not going to continue to do so at this without rising some, in, some, some rates. And so that person at home who's on a fixed income is going to be the person who really suffers the most. And, and that's something that I think as a community, I, regardless of party label, we have, to, um, we have to be able to explain to people. Very quick, I don't have to be just a green eye shape that kind of guy. Historically, we have had revenue 16% roughly of GDP. That's been our revenue model. And it, it touches up to 18%. But we've been spending 18 to 20%. But with in the present of Obama years, we've been up over 23%. You know, the problem, the challenge that I have with the, the president's budget is it never, ever comes into balance over 75 years. He's presented these budgets four times in a row. It never, ever balances. Well, if you never balance your budget, you never pay down the debt. And when you're paying more than $700 million a day in interest on that debt, you can't do it. But that's going to take people on both sides. It, I, I don't want to be, hey, it's just the Democrats and others. The reason we're in this in large part is because we did things like prescription drugs and other things and didn't pay for it. If that's the way the country wanted to go, great. Figure out how to pay for it and live within our means. That's what the state does, but it's certainly it's not what the federal government does. Senator Jenkins. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to shift gears here a little bit on you. It's been fun watching you on your oversight committee and uh, uh, the direction you've been uh, going on this Benghazi issue. Well, Benghazi's kind of relaxed and you don't care much about it anymore. In the end, when it's all said and done, I'd really like to know your opinion on this. Was Secretary uh, say Clinton asleep at the will? Was it uh, somebody below her? What kind of give us your feeling on that? Um, Mike Birch uh, is the uh, chairman of the uh, oversight of National Security Online Defense and Foreign Operations. I have spent quite a bit of time on Benghazi and, and some other issues. We have not heard all of this. I wish the administration would be more open and transparent, provide us the documents that I think are required by law to give to us. Um, the Accountability Review Board, I think, will um, still has a lot to, to answer for. I think what I heard yesterday in the Senate testimony that uh, Secretary Panetta uh, gave is stunning to me, and this is the second time I've seen it, and Again, I, for my Democrat friends, I don't want you to think I'm being overly partisan, but I hope objectively that they would look at this and say, so we're under attack. We have an ambassador that's missing. At the, at the beginning, we had two dead people. Um, by the time it was concluded, we have four dead people. And the Secretary of Defense never spoke with the President except at 5 p.m. Now, I don't understand how the Commander-in-Chief when we're under attack and Americans are dying on sovereign U.S. territory, is not more fully engaged. That is, I mean, that's what the Secretary of Defense said, is that he would never speak with the President. Then he was asked, I believe it was with Senator Lee, uh, as well as Senator Cruz, asked the Secretary of Defense how much interaction there was with the Secretary of State. And they said that they never spoke. Now, I, I just don't understand why and how that can happen. Um, it's one of hundreds of questions that I still have on this particular incident. But I think we all have to be concerned about this because we have hundreds of embassies and consulates. 
We have thousands of people that serve overseas. We have a host of Utahns who serve in those posts as well. And the concern is that this will spread and will be more vulnerable in these embassies in our foreign presence across the globe. And you know what? The United States of the United States of America is just different than the rest of the world. We are open. We are transparent. We do dive into these things and talk about it in the light of the day. That separates us from everybody else. And we should, there shouldn't be anything partisan about this. Of course mistakes are made, but that's how you, you're supposed to learn from them, not just cover them up. Take one more question. Senator Alderman. Congressman, good to have you with us. Thanks for your time. It's worth back. I don't know how hard you're working. Uh, you mentioned working with the other congressman on uh, some public lands issues and maybe being close to making a recommendation. We've been working closely with uh, county commissioners across the state, working on a lot of issues, including natural resources and, and other things that are really important to our state and, and ultimately really important to the economy of not just our state, but the entire country. Uh, are we going to be able to uh, get this, uh, some, something like this through? Is this a good model to be able to get this through Congress? How do we do this? I hope so. I mean, at the end of the day, I'd like this to be as bipartisan as, as we can possibly make it. My biggest fear is that the president is going to use the Antiquities Act to just unilaterally do what was down, uh, done previously in the state. That is a bad and flawed process. I've introduced a bill, uh, followed up on the heels of some of my predecessors who have now retired from Congress. I'm now carrying the bill that says that we have to reform the Antiquities Act and it should get the approval of Congress. This is the way that there is public input and participation. What should be right in principle should be right in principle, whether it is a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. And um, these are very contentious issues, but we're trying to do it as open as we can so that by the time we get to the finish line, um, you have something that's palatable to, to all sides. Now, They'll probably be paying on all sides too. Um, if this was easy, I'm sure it would have been done a long, long time ago. Um, but our engagement, I think, at the county commissioners uh, level, making sure that the counties are engaged in these processes so they're not just waking up one day surprised. And I think they've done very well. Emory County, for instance, has been one of the best and most proactive in saying, this is what we'd like to do. And they're willing to do things on both sides. And uh, I like that model. We'll see if we can pull it off. Um, but we're trying. I think that's one of our, our duties and responsibilities. So thank you. Thank Mr. you very much. Thanks for having me.